So this is a more old school kind of refrigerator that uses actual liquid helium to reach low temperatures. So we have here a vessel that contains 250 liters of liquid helium. Helium boils at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 269 Celsius. And so if you fill up this other tank with some of that liquid helium, you will have in here a whole you know, bath that is at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, minus 269 Celsius. And then you can put a stick in there, dunk it in there with your device attached to it, and do some experiments on that. Now, this is actually it's called a variable temperature insert because it goes to 4.2 degree Kelvin, but it also has a fairly big pump that can pump on a little pot of that helium so that it goes to one and a half Kelvin. If you pump on a gas, you reduce the vapor pressure, you reduce the, the temperature at which it boils. So if you follow me here, there should be, yeah. So this is the insert that goes in there. So you remember what you, the chip that you saw down at the bottom of the yes. tail in the fridge? The same thing can go in here. So you attach right. it here. And then this whole stick gets dunked into that bucket of liquid helium. And then you can actually pump it to go to one and a half Kelvin. And you can get to one and a half Kelvin in maybe 20 minutes. Okay. Whereas that guy takes two days to cool down. Got it. Uh -huh. Yes. So here is where we do fast turnaround experiments. You want to check something quickly, 20 minutes, you're cold enough to start see things. That single electron transistor will show you that mm. conductance peak. So you can see that sort of stuff. Okay. So if you're experimenting with a new material and you yeah, want to know stuff like go, just want to no take some statistics, you know, try 10 of them. You know. yep. This one goes to 0 0.3 Kelvin, mm. 300 millikelvin, and it uses helium-3. So in this little bowl here, there are four and a half liters of gas of helium-3, which is the light isotope of helium that misses one neutron. And it has a lower boiling point and a lower vapor pressure. And this doesn't use an actual mechanical pump. It uses a sorption pump. So this thing here, this little pot, is full of activated charcoal. Nice. Charcoal has a very high surface area. It's very porous. And when you cool down something very porous with a very large surface, it tends to absorb uh, atoms. Right. So the way you run this is that you put it in the, in the pot where it goes to one and a half Kelvin. You close this thing. This is a vacuum can. So you close the vacuum there and you pump it so it's vacuum. This can go colder than the external temperature. And while you cool it down, you apply a little bit of heat to this thing here. So it's about a 50 Kelvin. Then you stop heating. This thing cools down, and as it cools down, it, ups oh, it sucks up the helium-3 that's right. in the pot at the bottom. Okay. And it pumps on it, and it goes to 0 0.3 Kelvin, and it stays there for about two days until the whole thing has run out. And then you have to restart the cycle. It takes 20 minutes to restart the cycle. And then you got two days of 0 0.3 Kelvin without any mechanical vibration. It just stays there. Right. You could also use that, the physics department would use this for experiments on material and other stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is used for... Or do they yeah. have their own facilities for that? No, no, they do, they do. They, they, they have things like this. This one is custom made to be bigger. So as you've seen on the big fridge, we have fairly large chips because of the high frequency lines and the PCBs that we need and so on. And so I asked this company in the UK to build me a setup that was of the same size so I can accommodate the same boards. Right? I don't want to have to be limited by space here when I then have all the space in the final experiment. And then I can show you the pumping room if you like. Yes, pumping room, let's go. So the whole refrigerate, it's at the back. So the whole refrigeration system relies upon a circulation of helium-3 gas mm -hmm. at very high flow. So there are some big pumps and for, you know, comfort and, and noise and also interference, we've put all the pumps in a back corridor. Oh, here we go. So here oh. is where oh. the no magic happens. This is where the noise happens. Noise right? happens, right? okay. So this is an old school roots pump that is used to pump on the liquid helium bath to get to one and a half Kelvin. It's an old roots blower working in, in reverse. And over here are the pumping systems of the dilution fridges. These ones, this is a pair of turbo pumps. These are high flow turbo pumps. They circulate the helium-3 through the big fridge. These ones. 
And then they're backed by a scroll pump down there at the bottom. That one. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so the helium-3 gas goes through this pumping system. Then it goes through a bucket of liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. That's just sort of for, for safety. If there is any tiny air leak across the circuit, the air gets frozen into this liquid nitrogen bucket and doesn't go and clog the system in the fridge. And here are the tanks with the mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. So this is the actual gas that gets circulated. It gets liquefied and dumped into the, into the fridge, and then just the helium-3 circulates around. And then when we extract all the gas out, when we warm up the system, it goes into these tanks. So do you make these in-house, or do you No, this uh, is commercially bought. No, just, this you can buy. Yeah. Companies are specializing in Companies are specializing in these things. It used to be an artisan thing. When I started as a student, I actually I didn't build it myself, but I modified one that was built by the student before me. So until you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was the thing would be the artisan project. Nowadays, there is so much demand for these things because of quantum computing that there are companies that just build it commercially. Oh, this is the compressor. This is the helium compressor, the thing that does the ch 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 yep. Yeah, so this is the equivalent of the little motor you have in your fridge at home, <laughs> except yes. instead of being this big, it's yeah. this big. <laughs> it gives you a sense of the, yep. the... And this is the chilled water. So this compressor heats up a lot, so you need to keep it cold with a flow of chilled water. And yeah. these are more of the same? Yeah, that's all racks? the same. Yeah. Okay, same similar same. Just okay. replicated. Yes, you're not moving labs anytime soon, that's for sure. Look, uh, sometimes you do it, you know, sometimes you gotta do it. It's, right. These things are on wheels, you know, it's, okay. it's, right. those ones are hard to move because of the vibration isolation. That makes it really hard. But if you saw the normal one without the vibration isolation, it's actually not too bad. Is it years of refinement to get these systems reliable, doing what you want, doing precisely what you want? So these things are commercial now, they work, you know, okay. turnkey, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. In the old days, it was a bit more fidgety, but you know, this, by, by now, this is an established technology. You know, there's still, there's still progress. People keep improving little bits and pieces, but the basic technology is, is, is settled. Okay, so this is the uh, fabrication facility where the silicon quantum chips are fabricated. It's actually only one part of it. There are other ones, but they're not as easy to see. This one is nicely behind big windows, so I can actually show you inside. So here we have, this is a semi-clean area. I'll show you in a moment the cleaner area. Here we have some uh, metal deposition systems and various analyses and bonders and microscopes. So this is where we uh, deposit either dielectrics or metals on top of the chip. And the deposition is normally done after there has been a, a lithography step. So the, the typical way in which we would make, let's say, the metallic gates for a nanoscale transistor is by a combination of electron beam lithography, metal evaporation, and liftoff. So um, you start from the bare silicon chip, put it on a spinner that spins at 5,000, 7,000 RPM, depending on the details of what you want to do. You put a drop of a resist. We normally use PMMA, polymethyl metacrylate which is like um, liquid glass. And then we put the chip in an electron beam lithography machine, which is actually over there, so I can show you if you like. Okay. So that's the machine over there. You see a rate 150 direct right. So that's an electron beam mitogra lithography writer. Essentially what it is, it's a very tightly focused beam of electrons. Imagine an old cathode ray tube television, but you know, the $2 million version of that, right. where the beam has a spot size of two nanometers. And you can raster it and scan it across the chip. So where the electron beam hits the resist, the resist gets microscopically modified by the electron beam, such that if you then take the chip out and put it in what's called a developer, it's basically a solvent that can dissolve the, uh, the area that's been exposed to the electron. You can then remove the, the, the resist where it's been exposed by the beam. So you can literally write patterns on the chip with an electron beam, right? So you just make a CAD file, and you write that pattern. You develop the resist, so you get no resist, so you get the bare silicon or whatever is on top of the silicon, 
exposed. Then you go to the other side where we have the metal evaporators. So you can put the chip upside down in, for example, an aluminum evaporator. You evaporate aluminum, so the aluminum coats the whole chip. But where the resistor has been removed, it goes straight onto the silicon. Whereas everywhere else, it goes on top of the resistor that is still there. And then you take it to another kind of solvent that will dissolve all the resist that's left there. So all the aluminum that's on top of the resist floats up, gets lifted off, and you only are left with the metal that is sticking directly to the silicon. So that's how you can make those tiny gate structures. So there's no traditional mask stuff? There is for the larger features. Oh, for the larger features. That's right. Okay. So that is, uh, we have a mask aligner. It's actually not here, it's in another room. But so you, we still do optical lithography for the micron size features. Uh, for the nanometer size features, we need electron beam lithography. Of course, in the semiconductor industry, people have UV lithography, extreme yes. UV lithography, but we don't have access to right. that. That's a billion dollars of stuff. So. so you're talking small scale stuff here, like research. This grade. is a research. This is a research. Nothing commercial at all. You, you couldn't manufacture. If we even came, if somebody came to you and said, can you com commercially manufacture any sort of silicon, you wouldn't really do it? Well, it depends what you want. So this is a prototyping facility, really. I mean, commercial, I shouldn't speak out of line. It may be, it's, it's, it's a facility that can be accessed by users other than members of the university, right? So there are companies that come here to do uh, prototypes and testing. To the best of my knowledge, but I may be wrong, I don't think there's any commercial company that produces things in here. I'd be surprised. What this place gives you is the flexibility to try a lot of different things. Right? And that's the difference between the kind of research I do as an academic versus the manufacturing of a quantum computer. Right? These facilities are great for me because I can do whatever I want. I can change the process, I can tweak it. The reason why you have you know, 10 billion transistors on a silicon chip made reliably is because that process is so rigid. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's so well specified and so rigid. You can't just say, oh, let's try something else no, today. No, 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 right? no, no, no. Right. So it's just different, different yeah. demands and different needs in right. terms of what you want to do. Is there another research chip manufacturing facility in Australia like this or is this? Oh, there's many of them. Oh, right. So, well, so this is called the Australian National Fabrication Facilities. It has nodes in most states in Australia right. with many universities. Um, the thing that's special here is that because of the 25 years of history of developing silicon quantum devices, we just happen to have, a, not happen, we have deliberately accumulated a set of tools that are specifically chosen for the manufacture of silicon devices. So there will be other nodes in Melbourne, in Brisbane, in Adelaide, and in Perth that have all sorts of tools similar to this, but they may not have the silicon specific tools that we have. They may have other things that are specific to some of the things they're interested in. Right? But this is financially attached to the University of New South Wales, or it's not, or they're just using the it is blended. So, of course, the space is within the University of New South Wales, but the infrastructure is part, it's a national infrastructure. It's called the Australian National Fabrication Facility. The university gives some in-kind contributions, and there's a whole complicated budgetary way in which this thing is run, but it's not a university facility as such. So it's a basically Australian taxpayer-funded facility, really. And users. So users pay for access to the facility, but there is a subsidy to make it accessible to academics to do the research, you know, without having exorbitant costs. So the, um, those vents on the top, so that's the laminar airflow. That's so nice. if you want to see what happens here, when you enter this especially clean part of the clean room, yep. so there's the mat there, of course, for the, for the dust on your feet, while well, you'll have overshoes, of course. You go in there, you get an air shower, Oh, yeah, oh, yes, I can see the jets. See that? Yeah, jets, yeah, right. air shower. Yep. Then you go inside, and once you are inside, you can see from here there are these grills at the bottom and grills at the top. There is a laminar flow of air that makes sure that whatever speck of dust may come off you actually gets sucked oh, down instead of. It would go of, straight down, it would straight never down go outwards. Yeah. 
Right. So yeah. what class clean room is this in terms of filtration? Uh, I should know, but I don't remember. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's yeah. pretty good. It's it's okay. uh, it's, it's it's up there. It's up there. Yeah. And the lights, of course. Um, that's that's yeah. That's for photolithography. So there is actually some photolithography stuff. going on here. Okay. Oh, so they wouldn't ordinarily have them on like that, or un unless it's always, that. It's, oh, always, it's, always it's always on. It's always it's always on. But yeah. Okay. Regardless of whether yeah. they're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. So, they so don't you don't forget. have to. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs>